Jesus is coming. So this song, um, listen to the words. I'm gonna teach you folks the uh, the chorus. The chorus goes like this. You can put the chorus up. Like a bride.
and we can't wait for the day when we see you face to face. Anoint us the part of your Holy Spirit and bless us today to give you all the glory, honor, all the praise because you are so worthy. In Jesus' name, and we all say,
like the whole world to hear it. Please bow your heads with me as we ask God's presence to be here this morning, this afternoon. Father God, you are a great God. You desire our good and you give great gifts. Today and last night we've heard about the grace that you offer, the freedom that you give in the gospel of Jesus Christ, giving his life as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. For that we are grateful and today we worship you and we sing to you praises because how good you truly are. In Ephesians, you tell us to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with our hearts. So today, Lord, we ask that every song that is sung would be a worship and praise to you, that our hearts would be drawn closer to you, and if there's anything in our lives that we are holding back, we ask, Lord, in these moments that we would give it to you because of all the good things that you have done for us. Lord, as we hear a message about how you have called us to reach one another for your kingdom, we pray that our hearts would be inspired by the life that you live and the life that you gave so much that we would serve joyfully and we would fulfill the great commission of reaching others for you. Today we give you our hearts and we know that song is as much a part of worship as is prayer. And so today our songs are prayers to you in gratitude and thanks for the life that you have given and for the life that you offer and extend to us. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to the third segment of our 2017 Oahu Convocation. How many of you have enjoyed it so far? How many of you have been inspired? We want to thank you for joining us. And I wanted actually to focus on our young people a little bit more this afternoon. So at this time, I'll ask um, Jared and Nyla to start it off with our scripture reading. Good afternoon and happy Sabbath, church. Our scripture reading today, this afternoon, will come from Mark 5, verse 1 through 20. Then they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him. And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus? Thou son of the most high God, I adjure thee by God, that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, Saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now was now there was there a nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine, that we may enter them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea, and were choked in the sea. 
So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus, and see him that was possessed with the devil, and had a legion sitting and clothed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened, and him who had been demon-possessed, and about the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed, and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word.
That was powerful. Be very sure your anger holds and grips the solid rock. Thank you, my brothers, for sharing that. I find that uh, music can be very inspirational. It can be very encouraging. It can be didactic. It can teach us. We can learn from music. I am a great music lover. I will not sing a solo for you tonight. <laughs> and you should probably appreciate that fact. But uh, I love, I love music and I always have. The title of this message, the segment is called An Inspirational Message. Message of inspiration in our convocation bulletin. And I'd like to thank Jared and Nyla for reading our scripture from the book of Mark. Powerful stories of Jesus' activity. You know, the favorite place for me to hang out in the Bible is the Gospels. I find myself drawn to them over and over again because we find presented there Jesus in action. And it's good to read the theology expressed in the New Testament, the history of the Psalms and the Old Testament, but there's just something about Jesus that keeps drawing me back to the Gospels. In fact, if I don't have a plan to read other places, I'll just keep reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John over again because the stories are just so powerful. And tonight my message is entitled, Go Tell Your Friends. Go Tell Your Friends. Pray with me. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the day you've given us. We thank you for the blessings we received. We thank you for reminding us that you love us and that you will give us power to be obedient to you. Thank you, O oh God, for giving us this message. Thank you, O oh God, for everything you've done for us. Throughout eternity, we will be praising you and thanking you. And we ask, O oh Lord, that at this time that you would be with us in this sermonic moment, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The scripture reading that was shared with us by our young people is a narrative. It's a simple story with deep implications, both theological and practical. I, I would suggest that no theological supposition is valid without a practical implication and application. No theological supposition is valid without practical and implications and application. As we look at this passage, we find that this story is also recorded in Matthew, and Matthew mentioned demoniacs, plural, whereas Mark and Lucas, Luke focused their attention on one, and one author says, probably because this one was the worst of the two demons that were recorded in the book of Matthew and Luke. Mark's gospel is the shortest of all the four gospels. And in powerful prose, Mark tells story after story about Jesus. Many of the stories bear eyewitness authority. The early church believed that Mark, a close companion of Peter, reported what Peter had actually witnessed and represents Peter's testimony to the life of his Lord. And so we have the story of a man who lived in the graveyard. Do you know anybody who lives in the graveyard? I don't, and I wouldn't. I do know that there are some graveyards who have places for the ground keepers to live, but that's not going to be where I'm going to live, all right? Um, why did he live there? People don't usually live places where dead people are buried. Why did he live there? Was it because his friends and family thought of him as though he were dead because he was possessed with demons? 
You may have some friends that you have written off because something they have done to you, you consider them former friends or people as good as dead. Maybe they put you on blast on Facebook and told a secret or somehow embarrassed you and, and you have not been able to forgive them. You, you, you count them as dead and you don't want to see them or acknowledge them ever again. The hurt may be so deep that they cause you, the pain may be so intense and real that you don't even want to think about them again. For you, they're as good as dead. But this man, he wasn't dead. He was alive, living in a graveyard, living Yet the Bible tells us he was full of demons. Now, we need to capture the positioning of this story because this story takes place immediately after reading the gospel uh, sequentially. It happens immediately after Jesus had calmed the ocean and stilled the winds. In fact, the disciples said, what manner of man is this that the winds and the waves obey him? So in the sequence of the story, now that boat that they were in arrives in this place, Jesus gets out and immediately they see this man who has been living in the graveyard, dwelling among the tombs. Now, we recognize today that there are people who are demon possessed. Don't name any names. And you don't really have to foam at the mouth or be shackled by chains as this man to indicate that you are following the devil's password, pathway. And it doesn't matter how demons get control of you. And, 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 and in this story, the Bible writer does not indicate how these demons came to possess this man. I would suggest to you that anything, anything that weakens the willpower is a pathway to demon possession. Substance abuse, uncontrolled sexual appetites, dominating, dominating spirit, food addictions, even spiritual legalistic thinking that puts you in the in group and someone else in the out group can lead to being possessed. It doesn't matter how the possession comes, but it does come. And we don't know how this man got possessed, but we do know that he had been bound many times. And the Bible says in verse four, because he had often bound, been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. He was a bad brother. Chained, and he would break the chains. You know, this reminded me of a trip that Audrey and I took in 2011. We visited the African country of Nigeria, and we have a Seventh-day Adventist University there, uh, just south of Lagos, and uh, we went there. Actually, this particular college or university, Babcock University, has about 8,000 students, but we learned that only about 20% of them were Seventh-day Adventists. And so on the campus, they have continual evangelism. And so Audrey and I were invited there, and, and, and I uh, gave a reaping, a series of reaping meetings, and the students uh, responded quite, quite freely. Large numbers came forward to be baptized. But while there, we took a trip to a place called Badagory. You can look it up and find out about it on the, on, on the websites. But Badagory was the port where the Portuguese had a slave auction and we actually went into buildings that had been preserved as a museum now and we saw the places where the slaves stood and where they were auctioned off and we actually went into one place where they had preserved some of the actual chains that the slaves wore and I wanted to feel, Audrey wanted, and I wanted to feel what those chains felt like so the gentleman who was the curator of the museum put the chains around our wrists and they, and they were very heavy. And when he put the shackle around my neck, the weight of those chains was so great, I had to struggle to stand straight up. We learned that those chains that I was, aware, that I was wearing weighed about 65 pounds. And then the man took us on a one mile march to the Atlantic Ocean, where the slaves would be marched there 
If any of them died on the way, they were buried right on the spot. And we passed graves, markers, where people were buried hundreds of years earlier. And we were told when we got to the shore that if they arrived there and they had missed the ship, that then the slaves were marched northward to the next country where the ships came more frequently, and I believe that was Senegal. And a, a, a fullness welled up in us because we recognized that we were survivors of the slave trade. Nearly 550,000 people were shipped from Africa to Europe, South America, and to North America as slaves. Powerful experience. And so when I read about this man with these chains on his neck and on his arms, that, that he broke him, I, it reminded me that he must have had some supernatural power within him that enabled him to break those chains. And as fast as he would break them, they would rechain him, but they broke him again. And the Bible tells us that he would cry out during the night and that he would take stones and he would cut himself. Now, what really was going on was that there was a battle between this man's will and the demons that possessed him. And he was trying to drive the demons out by cutting his own flesh a part of his own mind still existed a part of his free will still existed and he did not want to maintain that occupied position but he didn't know how to free brothers to get free brothers and sisters we cannot free ourselves from the chains that bind us you may not be an alcoholic you may not be a person who has spread their sexuality all over the islands. You, you may not have any of those signs, but wherever Satan has control, we have chains. And the only chain breaker is Jesus. Amen. And the story goes on to tell us that when the ship arrived, that Jesus ran, after the demon ran, and he threw himself at the feet of Jesus. Verse 6 says, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. So something was going on in his mind. He recognized this person being Jesus. And I don't know how he got the message. I don't know how the word went. Perhaps he heard from some visitor talking about it as they came to visit the tomb of their dead one. But somehow he knew this was Jesus. And the demons within him recognized that this was the Son of God. But the man himself, he ran and threw himself at the feet of Jesus and he worshiped him. Here's a lesson for us. We should always hasten to run to the feet of Jesus. Amen. We should always be ready to go into his presence. We should not delay responding to the voice of God. Every opportunity we get to worship God, be it singular or in the family or in the church service, every chance we get to worship God, we should make haste to be there. I believe that David had something to say when he said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord, because in the house of the Lord there should be forgiveness. There should be acceptance. There should be encouragement. There should be in the house of God freedom to worship him. And so this man, he came and ran and threw himself at Jesus. And of course, the narrative says that the demons who oppressed him and controlled him, they were struggling also. And they cried out to Jesus and they said to him, they said to him, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. The demons know that when Jesus shows up, they are beaten. Oh, man. I wish I could get some church people in here. When Jesus shows up, the devil got to leave. He's out of business, out of commission, out of control, out of power. Everything he's got is vetoed when Jesus shows up. And he knew it. He knew that he was out of business. And so he pleaded. And check this out. 
Jesus asked him his name. Now, there's nowhere in Scripture that we are recommended or encouraged or commanded to dialogue with Satan. I don't want to talk to him. He's smarter than me. I mean, he got a third of the holy angels to follow him. You know, what kind of stuff can he sprinkle in my eyes? What kind of mist of logic? You know, it sounded good to those angels who fell with him that they should not be under the control of God and said, we're going to rise up. Well, if he can fool them, what do you think he can do with us? So I'm not going to talk to the devil. I'm going to talk to Jesus. I'm going to talk to the king who died for me, whose blood was shed for me. I'm going to talk to the one who cares about me so much that he hung on Calvary's cross and died for me before I was even born. Ooh. I mean, before the foundations of the earth were laid, the plan of salvation was determined. Check it out. God didn't send Jesus as a second thought. It was God's plan before he created Adam and Eve. That if humanity should uh, uh, prevail themselves uh, uh, to choose not to follow God, that a plan of redemption would kick in. And as soon as there, well, let me say it this way. Before there was sin, there was a Savior. Amen. Amen. Before there was a sin, there was a Savior. Because whatever exists in the mind of God indeed exists even if it hasn't happened yet. Jesus dialogue with the devil. And he asked him, what's your name? You know, if I was talking to the devil, I wouldn't be asking him, what's your name? I'd be saying, we ain't gonna leave. <laughs> Why'd you show up? But Jesus asked the demon, what's your name? The response was legion. Now, a legion, a legion, remember, a legion was about 120 soldiers. Oh, 120 soldiers, 120 demons in this one man? How did that happen? The Bible does not explain it to us. All we know is that it happened. The demons were in control. The man wanted to be free, but the demons would not leave voluntarily. Understand this, the devil will show up, and once he takes control, he's not going to leave without a fight. And you and I, we don't have what it takes to whip him up. Ooh, I started to say a bad word, excuse me. Y'all praying for me, thank you. <laughs> we, we don't have what it takes to kick him out, but Jesus does. Praise God for Jesus. Now remember, remember everything that God does is with the tension, intentionality of purpose. So whatever it was, he asked him his name. You know, we serve God, and as I said, he's intentional as a purpose, and he has a plan for our victory. <coughs> Everything that comes our way, God is prepared for. Now you'll remember the story of Job. In Job chapter 1, 9, it says this. Does God, does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse your face. Curse you to your face. Why was God, why was Job saying that? Why was the devil saying that? Because he was trying to entice God to do something against Job. He implied, of course, that we only serve God because of what we get out of God. But we serve God because we love God, amen? amen. We should serve God because we love him. Now when the demons were cast out, they proved what Jesus said in John 10, 10. He says, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that you might have what? Life and have it more abundantly. And Jesus sent on their request those demons into the herd of swine. Now he could have sent the demons anywhere, but when he chose to send to the pigs, he accomplished several purposes. Number one, he just demonstrated that the demons were real and that their deliverance was genuine. There were people watching what was going on. So he demonstrated that demons were real and that their deliverance was genuine. They were cast out of that man and they went in 
into the herd of swine. Second, he gave vivid proof that Satan is a destroyer because that's all he wants to do with you and I. Satan's task by deceiving us or by getting us to follow him, by capturing us and chaining us in the habits of sin, all he really wants is for us to share hell's fire when it rains from on high. He wants us to keep him company when the earth becomes a crispy critter. Jesus said, hell was not prepared for you but for the devil and his angels. That's who hell's fire is prepared for. Finally, the destruction of the pigs revealed the spiritual condition of the people in that district. They would rather have their swine than have Jesus. Wow. They even asked Jesus to leave. I mean, they came on the scene and they knew who this man was, but suddenly, as the Bible tells us, they find him clothed because he was naked. They found him clothed and in his right mind. See, when you go into sin, you've lost your right mind. You've got the wrong mind. You've got the bad mind. You've got the evil mind. You've got something that is not going to be productive of anything eternally beneficial to you. But this man was clothed, sitting in his right mind at the feet of Jesus. He was picking up everything from the Savior. He knew who this was. He had been delivered by him. And once God delivers you of whatever it is he delivers you from, then you and I, we ought to sit in the feet of Jesus and seek to find more and more of his power. We are safe only in the presence of Jesus. You're really not safe anywhere else. We're really not safe. And that's why we should pray every day that Jesus would be with us, that he would guide us, that we would follow his guidance and his direction. This man, this man, the Bible tells us that this man asked him in verse 18 of this chapter, it says, and when he got into the opening Jesus, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. He begged Jesus, Jesus, You've done something for me. Let me go with you. Let me become the 13th disciple. Let me hang out with you. Let me follow you. You've done, you freed me from the demoniac. You, you've given me my mind back. I don't have to have change. I've got real clothes on. I'm healed. I'm whole. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. How do we express our gratitude to God for forgiving us of our sins? How do we do it? You know, the only thing that really Jesus wants us to do after we have decided to follow him is what he told this man to do. Christianity is all about following Jesus. Amen. It's really not about obeying some rules. And I know that in the past of many people in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, there was a time when you really focus very legalistically on what you did and what you didn't do. And a wave of wind of grace has blown into the Adventist church. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This man's request may have been emotion based. I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to hang with you. I want to be one of your boys. I want to be numbered in that close group of people who follow you. I want to see everything you can do. I want to tell everybody that I go with you what you've done for me. I've got a word of witness to add to the crowd. But Jesus denied his request. Understand this. Everything you ask God for is not going to happen the way you ask. Him. Remember, when you pray, no is an answer. People say, well, God never answered my prayer. Well, what do you mean never answered your prayer? Well, I didn't get what I asked for. What? God told you he answered. He said, no. Don't you understand what no means? We don't like the word no. We don't like to hear that, do we? No. Boy, said authoritatively, no. <laughs> Jesus told the man, no. But this is what I want you to do. Go home and tell your friends what good things God has done Amen. for you. Understand the power of witness. I, I have had friends who said they were agnostics. You know what an agnostic is? Those fancy terms for people who can't make up their mind whether there is or isn't a God. 
So they hedge themselves on both sides and they don't decide. <laughs> they're called agnostics. So if it comes out there's no God, they're okay. If there's a God, they're okay. They, they haven't chosen a side. Agnostic really it means not enough information to decide. And I've talked to people who said they were atheists. And what I found is that when I have tried to discuss church policies or even doctrines of Seventh-day Adventists, that there is a response of an argument, a difference of opinion. However, when I tell people what God has done for me, they shut up and listen. Let me rephrase that. They assume a silent position and become very attentive. Because there's no argument for what God has done for you. Number two, in everybody's heart, they're believing that God is real. People want to believe. They want to meet a real Christian. They want to meet a person who's got a real experience. They want to meet a person who's got a real witness that they can give with confidence to them because everybody is looking for a place to hold that little bit of hope that they have somewhere. Your witness can be that hook for them until they get an experience of their own. The world is looking for the real Christians who've got a real witness, a good testimony. And remember what has been said, you can't have a testimony without a test. Amen. You've got to have something to say. And I can tell you my story about Magic Johnson. I got your attention now, don't I? <laughs> I never met him. You're disappointed already, aren't you? But I passed him in the Lantern Church where his family members were. And um, he has four sisters and three brothers. When I and Audrey were pastoring in that church, it was like 1978, 79, just before he signed his contract with the Lakers for a paltry 25 million at the time. They're making six times that in the NBA these days. And uh, somebody said, Pastor, you ought to go talk to him. Now, two of his sisters, a set of twins, Yvonne and Evelyn, and I tell you, I'm 6'2", or I used to be. They say you get a certain place, you, 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 your, your, your bones start shriveling. But those sisters looked me in the eye. Imagine 6'9". But they told me, I never saw them play, but they told me that the sisters played basketball at the same level as Magic did. People who witnessed that. And, and I never saw that, but they invited me to come to the house to talk to Magic. So I went to the house, and when I walked in, his uh, father, Irvin Sr., was sitting there, and two brothers, I think Michael and Quincy, they were sitting there, and, and, and they were not welcoming me. They looked at me, and if I could read their thoughts, they said, who's this preacher gonna talk our brother out of that $25 million? <laughs> But the members of the church said, Pastor, you ought to go talk to him. His soul is in jeopardy. Go talk to him. And like a young, foolish pastor, I said, OK. <laughs> so I get to the house. Brothers and fathers sitting there. Walk in. The magic's going to be back in about an hour. He knows you're coming. He wants to meet you. So I sat down. And two of his sisters, Lily and Kim, had gone to Oakwood College, now Oakwood University. And so I'm sitting there. And there's some sporting event on the TV. But there's a, the annual or the yearbook from Oakwood for that year that Kim had brought home. And so I was turning the pages. And she came and sat by me. And I looked at one page, and there was a picture of the new church. The church wasn't be, built to the year after I left Oakwood. And I was talking about that there had been a field there. And on some Fridays before going to Vespers, I would go out in the field, cow pasture. So I was careful where I walked. And there was a huge rock. And sometimes as the sun was getting ready to set, I would sit there and just talk to God. And I talked about how being in that atmosphere, my spiritual life was, became vibrant and rich. And I met the Lord Jesus Christ in a way that I hadn't known him before. And when I looked up, those two men, those three men sitting on the couch weren't watching TV. They were watching me. People will listen to your testimony because people really want to know, is God alive? 
And does God do things for people today? People want to know. If you, and if you had an experience with God, you should be ready to share it. Ellen White says this, as witnesses for Christ, we are to tell what we know, what we ourselves have seen and heard and felt. If we have been following Jesus step by step, we shall have something right to the point to tell concerning the way in which he has led us. This is the witness for which our Lord calls and for want of which the world is perishing. Desire of Ages 340. The last point from scripture is that your witness is a tool for victory. Your witness is a tool for victory. Revelations 12, verse 11 says this. Revelations chapter 12, verse 11. It says this, let me get there real quick. Verse 11 says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and that they did not love their lives to death. Your testimony is a tool against the nefarious acts of the devil. In conclusion, we may be struggling with an issue, problem, or concern. God cares. Jesus didn't show up on that side by accident. He went there because that man wanted to be free. He comes to us. God cares. God hears. God acts. God has plans for the blessing and prospering of his people. And God wants us to share with others what he has done for us. We must share it far and near what God has done for us. When we do that, we have done what God has called us to do. You may not get to preach, you may not even get to sing, but you can tell somebody what God has done for you. Amen. And you've done your job for Amen. the master. Amen. Father in heaven, help us to realize that while we may be under the power of Satan, that Jesus can break it today. That when we come into your presence and we sincerely confess and ask, you will free us of the demon. You hear the cry of our hearts, O oh God, and you will set us free. Thank you for every man, woman, boy, and girl who's come to this convocation this weekend. We thank you for every person who has sung, every person who has stood uh, and, and, and joined in the anthems. We thank you for the people who've read the scripture. We thank you for the organizers behind the scenes. We really thank you for the food that was prepared for us, Lord. We thank you for everything. Please, oh God, give us a way to tell other people what you've done for us so that they can open their hearts to you too. We pray in your son's holy name. Amen. Amen.